Welcome to the Welsh American Channel. Obviously, if you're a Welsh American or simply interested in learning more about the Welsh in the Americas, it all begins by understanding the country known today as Wales. The modern nation of Wales is about the size of the U.S. state of Massachusetts. It has over three million inhabitants, about the same population as the city of Los Angeles, California. It is a small nation in both geography and population, yet the achievement of its people and its sizable influence far exceeds its modest size. To use a modern expression, the nation of Wales has always punched far above its weight, as you will discover on this channel. The history of what is now called Wales begins with a Neanderthal presence at about 230,000 years ago. Homo sapiens arrived in this land about 31,000 BC. These primitive peoples lived in a hostile environment. The last ice age reached its climax about 18,000 years ago and all but wiped out the inhabitants of Western Europe. Then about 11,000 years ago, the Ice Age started to recede, and it wasn't until about 9,000 BC that we find continuous habitation by modern humans in the land that is known today as Wales. At this time, Britain was not an island as it is today, but a peninsula attached to Western Europe. It is believed that in about 6,100 BC, a giant tsunami slammed the northeast coast of Britain and hastened its transformation into an island cut off from mainland Europe. Wales has several human settlement remains from the Mesolithic, Neolithic, and Bronze Age. From the Iron Age, the ancient Britons were a people of Celtic language and culture who inhabited the Isle of Britain and eventually diverged into the Welsh, Cornish, and others. They spoke common Britonic, the ancestor of the modern Britonic languages. These Britons followed an ancient Celtic religion overseen by Druids. Druidism traces its origins to ancient Wales, where the order began long before the beginning of written history. Druids were the priests of the early Celtic religion, and on the top rung of a three-tiered Celtic society, consisting of serfs, then warriors, and at the top, the learned men, or druids. But in addition to their religious function, druids also performed the roles of judge, doctor, and scholar. The heart of druid influence was located on Anglesey Island or Ennis Mon in northwestern Wales. It became their last stronghold in a consolidated Britain after the arrival of the Romans. The southern Celtic tribes had strong links with mainland Europe, especially ancient Gaul, and some minted their own coins with Celtic art. The term Celtic is more of a common heritage and culture rather than an ethnicity. During the Iron Age, all of Britain south of the Firth of Forth near the modern city of Edinburgh was dominated by these Celtic Britons who spoke the Britonic language. By 100 BC, there were an estimated 1 to 2 million people living on the island. In 43 AD, the Romans invaded the island and began their conquest of the southeast. They first campaigned in what is now known as Northeast Wales in 48 AD against the Decla Angli tribe and gained total control of the region with their defeat of the Ordovici in 79 AD. The Romans departed from Britain, including Wales, in the 5th century as the empire began to decline. This opened the door for the arrival of the Anglo-Saxon tribes on the east of the island. Scholars today are debating whether this was an aggressive invasion of conquest or a migration of Germanic tribes into Britain seeking new land to live in. From this point on, the Britonic language and culture began to splinter, and several distinct groups were formed. As the Germanic tribes moved west, the native Celtic Britons tended to move into either the westernmost regions of the island, into what today is known as modern-day Wales and Cornwall, or up to the Old North, 
now known as Northern England and Southern Scotland. Modern DNA analysis shows that many ancient British inhabitants quickly assimilated into the Germanic tribes in their culture. The Germanic peoples referred to these British tribes by a term that has come to be pronounced as Welsh, meaning foreigner. Obviously, their language, religion, and customs were strange to the new arrivals on the island. In the post-Roman period, a number of Welsh kingdoms formed in present-day Wales, including Gwynedd, Prowess, Gwent, and others. The idea of a distinct peoples known as the Welsh began at this time. While the most powerful ruler was acknowledged as either king or leader or prince of Wales, none of them was able to unite Wales for long. Like all tribal peoples, the Welsh often warred against one another and added external pressure often came from the English. Hawulda was the king of Dehebarth, who eventually came to rule most of Wales by 940 AD. He codified traditional Welsh law, which afterward became known as the Laws of Hawulda. The latter part of his name, Da, means good, and refers to the fact that his laws were considered just and good with compassion rather than just punishment, plenty of common sense, and the recognition of rights for women. By 1081 AD, the Norman conquerors of England invaded the Welsh kingdoms and they gradually came under the control of the English crown by 1094. Yet rebellious and independent Welsh princes would continue to arise and gain influence for a short period of time. But in 1282, the death of Llewellyn ap Griffith led to the conquest of the Principality of Wales by King Edward I of England. Since that time, the heir apparent to the English monarch has borne the title Prince of Wales. King Charles III of the UK was declared Prince of Wales in 1958, along with his investiture in 1969. The present incumbent is Prince William since September of 2022. His investiture is yet to come. Yet even after the conquest of the Principality by King Edward I, the tenacious Welsh launched several revolts against English rule. The last significant one being led by Owen Glendower in the 15th century. Glendower was pronounced a native Prince of Wales on the 16th of September in the year 1400. And with his armies, he proceeded to attack English towns in northeast Wales. But by 1409, the rebellion was subdued by the capture of Harlech Castle. By the 16th century, Henry VIII, himself of partial Welsh lineage, the great-grandson of Owen Tudor, passed the Laws of Wales Act in 1535 and 1542. The goal of this law was to fully incorporate Wales into the Kingdom of England. Under English dominance, Wales became part of the Kingdom of Great Britain in 1707 and then part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland in 1801. Yet the indomitable Welsh retained their language and culture despite heavy English control. The Welsh people, their language and customs, refused to die. The complete Welsh translation of the Bible by William Morgan in 1588 tremendously advanced the foundation of Welsh as a literary language. The Welsh became one of the most literate peoples in Europe. The Welsh people love music, and especially vocal music. Welsh choirs are world-renowned. The 18th century saw the beginnings of two changes that would greatly affect Wales. The Welsh Methodist Revival, which led the country to turn increasingly nonconformist from the Church of England in religion, and the Industrial Revolution. The copper and slate industry began to dominate the economy of northwest Wales. The land was rich in mineral deposits. By the 19th century, southeast Wales experienced rapid industrialization and a dramatic rise in population as the result of the explosion of coal and iron industries. There was a shift away from the land with many tenant farmers in the rural west 
emigrating in the 1830s and 1840s and migrating to the cities in the second half of the 19th century. Wales played a major role in World War I. The British Labour Party replaced the Liberal Party in popularity and became the dominant political force in Wales beginning in the 1920s. A Welshman David Lloyd George became the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from December 1916 until October of 1922. Lloyd George was a major player in the Paris Peace Conference of 1919 that ended World War I. He gained a reputation as a powerful orator and a proponent of unique Welsh blend of radical liberalism that included support for Welsh devolution, for the disestablishment of the Church of England in Wales, and for equality for labourers and tenant farmers, and for reform of land ownership. Yet the major industries of the British Empire began to decline, including in Wales in the 20th century. Wales played a considerable role during World War II along with the rest of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and major Welsh cities were bombed extensively during the Blitz. The decline of the British Empire was hastened following the Second World War. Welsh nationalism and an interest in self-determination began to increase in the hearts and minds of many Welsh. The Welsh Nationalist Party gained momentum in the 1960s. In a 1997 referendum, Welsh voters approved the devolution of governmental responsibility to a National Assembly for Wales which first met in 1999. In May of 2020, The National Assembly for Wales was officially renamed the Welsh Parliament, sometimes just referred to as the Senate, to reflect significantly increased devolution and administrative power. This has been a brief outline of Welsh history. You can find many exciting videos in Welsh history on YouTube. I will put a few down in the comments area. My personal favorite is a BBC production called The Story of Wales. It was a mini-TV series first broadcast in 2012. All six episodes are presented by distinguished Welsh BBC presenter Hugh Edwards. In the 1800s, some of his ancestors came to Ohio as part of a Welsh migration. Four of the Edwards sisters actually traveled the length and breadth of North America singing as a quartet. So if you're a Welsh American, why did your ancestors leave the nation of Wales and emigrate to the Americas like my paternal grandfather did in 1897? One reason was overwhelming poverty and a lack of opportunity. Except for the Welsh gentry, Most of the Welsh people had little opportunity to improve their lives or that of their children. Even when industrialization arrived, the pay for being a miner in the pits or working in a factory was meager and often dangerous. Workers were considered disposable by the business owners who were frequently English and had little interest in Welsh needs. Another reason was religious persecution. Most of the Welsh became non-conforming Protestants and did not support the Anglican Church or Church of England. This also limited your opportunities for higher education and career opportunities or promotion. Another reason was the constant pressure of the English language and British institutions to eliminate the Welsh language and culture. It was labeled as ignorant and backward. For example, the Welsh knot was used as a type of badge in Wales from 1798 throughout the early 1800s and as late as the 1870s. It was brought about by teachers and school organizations to discourage children from speaking Welsh in school. It was an emblem typically made of wood and often inscribed with the letters WN, which might be worn around the neck. Here's how it typically worked. 
Following the start of some established period of time, it was given to the first child heard speaking Welsh and would then be successively passed on to the next child heard speaking it. At the end of the period, the child with the emblem, or sometimes all the children who had held the emblem, might be punished. The nature of that punishment varies from one account to another. It might have been detention, the writing out of lines, or corporal punishment. Yet the teaching of English in Welsh schools was often supported by the Welsh public and parents who saw English as the language of economic opportunity. This is just an example of the cultural suppression placed upon the Welsh that motivated many to leave their homeland and seek greater opportunities in the New World. Some Welsh leaders or intellectuals wanted to replant the Welsh language and culture in other areas of the world to preserve it. That is how the Welsh colony of Patagonia was founded in 1865 in southern Argentina. In the 2008 U.S. Census Community Survey, an estimated 1.98 million Americans had Welsh ancestry, or 0.6% of the total U.S. population. This compares with a population of 3 million in Wales. However, this survey may be grossly inaccurate, because 3.8% of Americans appear to bear a Welsh surname. From my personal experience, the overwhelming majority of Welsh Americans have little or no understanding of their Welsh heritage. I live in the great state of Ohio, and it is estimated that over 100,000 Ohioans have Welsh ancestry. Welsh immigrants started coming here over 200 years ago by raft down the Ohio River. They created their own small Welsh communities here. They conversed in Welsh, did business in Welsh, worshipped in Welsh, and even their gravestones are only in Welsh. This channel will explore their American history and the underappreciated influence of these unique people who settled in the Americas. You will be amazed, dumbfounded, at the large number of American leaders from every walk of life who have Welsh ancestry. So now you have been presented with a brief history of Wales and a greater understanding of why your ancestors may have left their beloved homeland to come to the Americas. In a future video, we will discuss who some of the earliest Welsh immigrants were who came to North America. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and please feel free to make any comments below. This is Greg Thomas saying Hoyle Amnauer. Bye for now.